What's up, everybody? I'm checking out the chat here as I come in, and I see a lot of R.A. from Recovery Addict and his stream. He's been streaming this trial. If you guys came from there, let me know in the chat. That's awesome. Um, some people have messaged me saying he said all sorts of kind things about me, which I always appreciate, um, including that I was one of the first lawyers, I think, that he watched on YouTube. And of course, he mentioned my hair. That seems to be something that is the first thing out of so many people's mouths is my hair. So yes, he mentioned the hair. So we are here and we are discussing Take Care of Maya. Um, and we are discussing the closing arguments, which were actually, there's a lot to unpack because I thought both were actually better than I expected. Not because I didn't think they were good lawyers at all. It had nothing to do with that. It is so difficult to boil down a complex multi-week trial into, I think two hours is what they had. I think 120 minutes is what they each had. And of course it started out with a bang with Howard Hunter, the lawyer for Johns Hopkins saying, we don't think they should be able to split it up 75 minutes and 45 minutes. They should only be able to split it up 90, 30. There's no actual rule on that. Um, the judge found the plaintiff's requested split of 75 minutes for their initial and then 45 minutes for rebuttal, or as sometimes we call it, first close and second close was appropriate. So, um, so yeah, that was just, you know, starting out with a bang because they didn't want him to have too much time to respond to what they had to say. Uh, but I really think it was, it's impossible for it to be perfectly smooth. Okay. So don't expect to be perfectly smooth ever when there's things like this. And Anderson bounced around a lot and he said he bounced around. I always think, I always err on the um, opposing side of that, of mentioning it. And, you know, I'm all for self deprecation. I actually love that. I think juries like it. I think people like it generally when you don't take yourself too seriously. Um, you don't think you're above it. You're not a stiff. You don't think you're better than anybody. You're not condescending in the way that you speak when you give these kinds of presentations, but I don't like pointing out flaws in your presentation either. Like, Oh, sorry, I'm all over the place. Cause then some people may think you already were all over the place and you're not going to change that by admitting it. But if somebody thinks that you, um, are not all over the place, but you tell them you're all over the place, they might start to think you're all over the place. So that's just kind of like speech giving, um, tips that I, I don't love when, lawyers or anybody giving a presentation does that personally. Um, but I thought Anderson really did a good job. And that's what I'm saying. I wish he wouldn't have said he was all over the place because I think, um, he was all over the place a little bit more in some of the questioning. And I think that it really comes down to, can you explain to this jury how bad this hospital is and why they need to check all the boxes that are good for you? Because just with how complex this verdict form is, and by the way, people wondering when the verdict is going to come, I think there is little to no chance that the verdict comes today. Uh, the Adelson verdict came a little quicker than some people were expecting. I think there's almost no way that this verdict comes today. Way too complex of a verdict form. They have to answer all these specific questions. They have to consider which causes of action carry with it punitive damages. There's no way. I would just be shocked. And if it does come today, I think it's going to be hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe a billion dollars for Maya because they just wanted to hammer the hospital. Um, but I, I really think they're going to have to think about it. It may take a couple of days. I would, I would guess this week a verdict, um, but I don't know if it's going to be tomorrow, the next day or when, but I don't think it's going to be today. And I do think it's going to be this week. So that's kind of the um, spectrum of time that I expect this to come down. Uh, Ashley, would you have kept juror number one? If I was the judge? Yes. If I was the plaintiff? Yes. If I was the defense? No. I realized they allowed him was, we're going to allow him to be an alternate, but it's really interesting. And we're going to get into the closing argument. I think Mr. Anderson was speaking directly to juror number one, a couple times. I don't know if you guys picked it up, but we're going to bring that in as well in our discussion of the closing arguments. Welcome to Karen, tons of new members. Um, which is awesome. If you haven't subscribed yet, hit that subscribe button. If you haven't hit the like button yet, go ahead and do that because we are jumping in now to these closing arguments. And I had some people mention they knew I liked uh, Judge Carroll and was fond of him throughout the trial. Some people have have emailed in and say, I liked this that he did. I didn't like this that he did. Um, and thank you for all those that came over from RA and liked and sub Julie F and a bunch of you in there. I appreciate that. Uh, the juror was not cut. Um, but when it started, a lot of people, 
you know, had texted in about Hunter Carroll and he stopped to take a moment himself and read a thoughtful, well-written thank you to everybody behind the scenes, everybody in the court system, his family, because it's a lot of hours, a lot of hours. It's difficult. It's stressful. There's pressure on him. He even complimented the media and the way they handled this trial. And that's a big deal with what's going on in our country. And a lot of lawyers um, wanting to strike the media, get rid of the cameras. Judges have to make difficult decisions. Certain states are kicking cameras out. Judge Judge made a tough decision to keep cameras in. The Koberger situation, especially after what happened with Vallo and Daybell, where that judge removed cameras in the same state. Daybell's trying to get cameras back. Well, if I'm a media company, and I, as shocking as it is, I never thought any of these people actually watched this channel. Any of the people involved, I, I never thought they actually watched this channel, but seemingly every day people are changing my mind about that. And if the media conglomerate is watching, I would clip what Judge Carroll said about the media in this case and how he said they handled it appropriately. It's been difficult. It's been nine weeks, a lot of stuff going on. You've been respectful. I know some of you had objection to their focusing in on Maya. Um, and I agree that's something that they need to fix. But when a judge like this in a case, this high profile, um, compliments the way you handled things in the courtroom and did not affect the trial, clip that, make it an exhibit when you're going and arguing in other cases that you should be there and you have a right to be there. Okay. So we are going to jump in very close to the beginning of Mr. Anderson's portion of the closing. We're going to listen to a chunk of Mr. Whitney's as well, which I got to be honest, we're going to talk about lawyers crying in closing arguments. Um, and I want to know how you guys feel about it. Don't, um, don't let me know yet. Cause I'm going to give you my take. I'm going to give you, if it's ever happened to me, um, we're going to talk about Alec Murdoch a little bit. And we're going to talk about Mr. Whitney who absolutely got choked up. And uh, I, I want to save that though, for that portion, but we are going to talk about his. And then of course, Mr. Shapiro's as well. And you know, for the most part, I'm not on that side. I practice on the other side, but I'm going to have a lot of good things to say about Mr. Shapiro's closing argument as well, but it's coming from a lawyer, a trial lawyer who knows how hard it is to put this together. And we're going to talk about whether or not certain things that a trial lawyer like myself think are really good, what kind of an effect they may have on a jury, which is what you guys are here for. And I want to hear from you and know what you all think. All right, let's listen to Mr. Anderson. In this case, for reasons that I still cannot fathom in many ways, Johns Hopkins doctors who are supposed to do no harm just blew up this family. It's beyond me. And I just have a difficult time understanding motivations. I understand more based on what we heard there at the last from Dr. Cochran about some of the whys of how it would happen. And Nick has reminded me, and I want to say this out of the box, uh, for certain reasons legally, when I say none of this or all of this, this that I am talking about is what happened to Maya back with Miss Beatty. That is what I'm talking about, that period from October 7th through January 14th. That's what I'm saying when I'm saying this, none of this, or all of this. And it's funny. He said that when you think about the defense's closing, they said, you know, the plaintiffs over here, they're trying to mix what DCF did and what they're responsible for. You have an instruction. Don't talk about DC or don't think about DCF or anything they did, you know, separating Maya from her family and just what the hospital did. Going to be really hard for them to separate all of that, obviously, but um, that's why he wanted to clarify. And Mr. Whitney reminded him to clarify that. So the problem here is that by what pressures they put on Viata Kowalski, they took her out of the game. And she was, without a doubt, the quarterback of this team. Jack is an amazing man. But Viata was a force of nature. And Viata was capable of incredible amounts of work, tenderness, love, compassion. But she was also of an Eastern European background, and she could be brusque. But she was a lioness protecting her family. And okay, that's the first mention of her being Eastern European. And remember... Juror number one, similar background. And he is going to mention that multiple times throughout this closing. And I don't blame him. Every juror is important. And when you know what certain pressure points with jurors are, are going to work and make them relate with your client, that's how you discuss it. 
because he's going to understand more than most people how if, uh, you know, their theory here is that pushy Eastern European, sometimes doctors look down on them or don't like them or treat them differently or treat them poorly. And he's going to hit that pressure point. And we get into eventually what happened on that October 7th afternoon and evening. And I want you to think about one thing. If Johns Hopkins had not changed its diagnosis that quickly over that particular day for reasons we'll get into, none of this would have happened. And the reasons that they eventually get into is Maya's mom pushed, said no, challenged them, argued with them, and they don't like to be challenged. And that's medical malpractice. They did absolutely no research. They did not bring in experts. They did not have anybody who knew what they were doing examine Maya. And from the Kowalski standpoint, six days before, they had been back in with the same complaints, which is gastroparesis, which is from CRPS, right? And here they come in six days later, and it's completely changed. Now they're somehow treated like criminals. They're treated as though there's something wrong with them, even though, and consider it from their point of view, they've been coming to this hospital since literally before any of the CRPS systems, uh, symptoms started. They've been going there for 15 months, and they never had a problem. They had support. And, and let me tell you, I, I don't think that everybody at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital was bad, wrong, or, or evil. There were some good people over there. Some of their uh, uh, outpatient doctors were superb. But something was very wrong with this hospital. And as I was saying, I think Dr. Cochran got to the heart of it with the culture there. It seems to me that any time you put together an organization where no one can speak up, no one can comment on anything that's going to rock the boat, you're going to get this type of situation. You're going to get a situation where a Kathy Beatty can run wild and no one will catch her. No one will slow her down. No one will get her out of this and away from Maya. All right. So there's our first mention of Dr. Corcoran, who was their, um, you know, medical, uh, you know, CEO expert, you know, how things are done at hospitals, the expert that testified to the IJ and the cultural issues there. And I'll just tell you this closing argument, those kind of statements. So I, I would have sat there for a minute and talked about that right off the jump. He hits it a couple times. I don't know if he's worried that, you know, there is a, 403 issue that if he goes too hard on it, that it could potentially be so prejudicial that it could overturn the verdict. At this point, I think he protected the appellate issue. I don't think he talked about it that much in closing argument, nearly as much as he could have, nearly as much as I would have, but he mentions it right there. And that cultural systemic, those type of, of words and issues in a company are the prototypical words and arguments you make in punitive damages claims. So when you look at a lot of it comes from employment cases where it's, they treat employees so bad that we have to have punitive damages to change the way they look, change the culture at this place. Cause they're not going to change it on their own. Um, though that is the type of verbiage that is used so often in those cases. And the fact that they have a document and an expert saying those words and saying that all children's has these issues is huge. It's huge. And he mentions it right off the top. He hits a couple of the best points right in the beginning of his closing, and that's what you have to do. There simply was no accountability at this place, none. So what you're trying to do now, and the way I was really thinking about it was, why don't I go through some of Johns Hopkins' defenses? Because I figured that if we got rid of the defenses, then all that would be left would be our case. And then it would be much easier for you to make up your minds about things. So if you look at some of their theories that we heard in the opening statement, one was that uh, – uh, Maya had come in emaciated and they saved her. All right. People are saying there's a jury question. So I will hop over to the stream. I'm going to keep listening to this for a minute. I'm going to hop over to the stream, pull it up. And when we actually hear the jury question, I will put it up on stream. Because uh, they put weight back on her. If you check out Dr. Watson hours weight, she was 27 kilograms one week before she went in there. And she was 27 kilograms when she was out two weeks later. So that theory has gone that they had. Doing two things at once is difficult, um, but I didn't want to miss this part. So he says she went in on some medication, came out on some medication. Basically, it was the same. The defense blows a hole in that argument when he talks about no narcotics, no ketamine, and no something else. Um, the worst drugs she was on, they got her off of those, and they're very proud of that. So that did kind of nuke this argument um, from the plaintiff, but he's trying to get rid of all the defenses, which makes sense kept her off or gotten her off a bunch of drugs. You can look at the admission to see what meds she was on at the time. You can look at the discharge summary and see how similar it is. Nothing there, nothing there. They argued that ketamine bad, ketamine bad, ketamine scary. 
ketamine. Here's a couple interesting words like ketamine bad, ketamine scary. And he's like, I, I don't freaking understand how they still did this. He said stuff like that a couple times. Um, just so you know, I have the stream up here on the side. So when the jury question comes, yes, we will talk about it. Feel free to let me know in the chat when you see that it comes up. Uh, I also see a bunch of people gifting memberships. Thank you, Roro. And thank you, Azam. And Deb Jackson Smith. Azam, hopefully you're feeling better. Let me know in the chat. Hurt. And they themselves, in their own routines and uh, methodologies, they actually had a ketamine infusion process. So it wasn't the fact of infusing ketamine. What it was was dosage. And they tried to scare everybody with the idea that these dosages were extraordinarily high. They, they worked, didn't they? They worked. And you know this because... And again, I think he has to say this, but I do think that's kind of a scary part of this is how high those ketamine dosages were. And putting someone in a coma, you're not going to have them feeling pain. And I think the defense did a good job combating this with some of Beata's own notes. Which, you know, again, the, we're going to talk about it. the plaintiff's own words. I felt like were used really powerfully by the defense. Because if you take a look at the progress through January through August of 2016 and the videos we showed you about how well Maya was coming along here, you can see how well they worked. Through all of this, keep in mind, there was never a bad lab. Usually, if there's a drug that's going to really mess you up, if you are having some significant problems, one of the things you do is you look for the blood test for the liver primarily. What you're looking for here is see if there's any substantial changes. Nowhere can they show you any continued or even, I don't think, any abnormal liver tests. That's an objective test that would tell you whether or not this was the wrong medicine or that there was too much medicine. They argued that Maya's recovery was all due to them. Well, no, it really wasn't. And she didn't really recover. She did much better. CRPS, as you know, is a disease that she's going to have the rest of her life. It's something that you manage. And so by taking her back so many steps, they made things so much worse for her. And it was only Maya's self-discipline and will. And I believe the idea in her head was that she wanted to prove to her mom that she could overcome, that she could do this, but it had nothing to do with Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. And she was not cured and she did not end up with no symptoms. On November 20th, she ended up with a terrible relapse. You'll see the photos of her with a feeding tube down her nose. And I mean, the one thing that struck out with me was that if you looked at her clavicle right here, she didn't even look like the same girl. That's how bad that relapse was. And then if you look at Dr. Henschke's records, you'll see that she had another one in 2022. It was simply, uh, Maya had not recovered everything that she did. She did herself. And in spite of Johns Hopkins, all children's hospital. So. And that was kind of a big one from the jump that we knew they were going to, to hit is how much better off she is now, how much better she's doing now, better post-hospital. They even bring out some doctors that say she's better post-hospital. Um, I see Hunter Carroll on the bench. So let's go ahead and take a, I'm going to pop this one down and get the other stream here. Get the audio. While we wait, I'll hit some comments and questions. I think it might take three days for the jury to decide. Could take more, could take less. I'm not positive myself. Uh, Cache, our eyes in the courtroom at Jules says the jury is two male. For female. Yeah, honestly, I don't know in this case whether it matters. I've been <clears throat> right, here we go. provided a, a note from the jury, and it says we'd like to access the Kirby Christie financial money that possesses the lost earned monies, what Maya would earn, etc., or slash also. We have documents we need to review, but don't know how to find it. One juror says, quote, teach me how to find stuff, end quote. And stuff wasn't the, the word used, but that's my substitution. Um, I also. So before we hear any of those arguments, what is your initial reaction when you hear that? Christy Kirby is the 
uh, finance person. She is the person that tells the present value of the damages and what the loss of capacity to earn is and how you calculate that to present day and what those numbers look like and how we got to those numbers. Tells me that they're already discussing potentially how much money they are going to award and make no mistake about it. We're again, we're going to get to the defense's closing. If this is a five or $10 million verdict, the defense is going to be okay with that. But when it gets into a hundred million dollar plus, they're not okay with that anymore. But it's like in, in trials, when they ask for a calculator, that's always my favorite jury question. And I, we usually don't give them a calculator because we want them to ask for it. And that sets us at ease a little bit that at least they're calculating numbers. So if they want to look at Christy Kirby's information to me, that is a good sign for the plaintiff. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean they've made any decisions. It's been what two hours since they've been back there. So it does not mean that I don't want anybody to jump to conclusions and say this case is over or anything like that. But jury questions give you an indication as to what they're thinking and talking about. And to me, they're trying to discuss what her loss of earning capacity is. And you wouldn't need to discuss that if you didn't think the hospital did anything wrong. Doesn't mean there's med mail, doesn't mean there's battery or false imprisonment, but maybe at least one of these causes of action that they think caused Maya to lose earning capacity is something that they are going to consider. So let's listen to now if the lawyers have anything to say. I want to indicate that uh, I understand that a uh, the jury was unable to access the thumb drive. I know that because they sent it to the court IT person who has converted it into an HTML. So I did want to let you know that uh, there was uh, Mike, who you've seen, has had some contact. So I wanted to first put that out there, let you know about it. Uh, if you want to have any follow-up about that, we can do that. So um, I understand that, and, and as a backdrop, you know, we have the little computer back there I, this is the first time that we, I think we've actually turned them on and it'll have office on it. So that's what happened. We don't have office suite on it. And so that's why they had to convert that flash drive that we had with the um, exhibits. <clears throat> There's no Excel. Now uh, he has uh, <clears throat> taken the computer that's downstairs in our jury room downstairs and has and just so you know, it is up to the lawyers to make sure the juries can find this stuff because we have to make it in a way. And usually that's where the bait stamps come in. And that's why you heard lawyers reference bait stamps when they were questioning witnesses and during closing argument, because you want them to be able to find the stuff that's good for you. But this jury is thinking for themselves and they want to find specific things that they found important. And they're trying to say like, how do we do this? How do we find a document we want to see if the lawyers didn't reference it in closing arguments and we don't have the exact bait stamp number because they reference a lot of documents. And that's what the judge is talking about now. How can we do this? Created and put office on it so he could swap it out if the parties wanted him to, or we can just let it be and just can have the computer that they have back there. Um, IT tells me the um, access to that uh, flash drive was the only thing they really needed office for. He's converted to an HTML file, so they would be able to uh, review that file electronically. So. That's where we're at. Any thoughts or how we should answer the question? Well, so long as that question about finding stuff doesn't mean they still don't have access it. I don't know. If you want to look at the, the, the note, you're happy to look at it. Why don't you come look at the note? School bus. As they're looking at the note, Again, we'll hit a couple of talk more about this. Yeah, I think male, female, age, everybody's got somebody they can relate to with this on either side. Um, their background is going to be a lot more important to me than gender, age, job, stuff like that. Read your testimony. Nina, yes. Unanimous verdict on every cause of action and the amount of money. And a lot of times if one wants to vote no and Five want to vote yes. They'll say, no, okay, we'll compromise by shaving a million bucks money. off or something uh, like that. Christy. But in civil cases, Question because there's money. Putting her report in. I'm not sure we were allowed to put our, our complete report in. Back it up so we don't miss anything. No one there, but there was uh, testimony about Kirby Christie. 
question was, I suggested Curry. putting her report in. I'm not sure we were allowed to put our, our complete report in, so they had notes about it. So I had predicted that they would want that report. Well, we, we need to come up with a response. Well, we object to them having the report. So a lot of times, life care plans, which is where it says, you know, she needs this treatment this many times a year for this many years, and it costs this much money. You can put that up on the screen as you're presenting it with an expert like by Fulco and, and Kirby is who they used in this case, but you can't put the actual reports back there in evidence. They're just demonstrative aids. So the jury has to rely on their memory and they have to take notes. So a lot of times what I will do is, and, and in this case, they didn't quite have enough time, but Whitney went up and talked about the numbers and we're going to watch that eventually. But what I'll do a lot of times is I'll put up the life care plan summary that has the exact amount of money for each area. And I will tell them, you're not going to take this back with you. This is not an evidence. So if you want these numbers, write them down now. Also a good indication when the jury starts writing it down, which happens a lot of times. So I will tell them that so they can write down all those breakdowns. But again, that's the difficulty of picking what to put in your closing argument when you have a nine-week trial and only two hours. Or not, Your Honor, because the report is hearsay, obviously. Uh, well, yeah, and it is hearsay. And the report, it shouldn't come in. I don't think they're going to let the report in. Well, whatever is in evidence is in evidence. Right. We're, not, we're not adding evidence yeah. at this point. This is just off the top of my head, but if part of the problem is just sort of IT technology issues, if, if, if you wanted to let your IT man go and help them learn how to do something on that, I, I don't see a problem. I'm willing to do that. I just, I didn't want to do that without sure, sure. the party's knowledge and assent. Oh, yes. And I, I would just simply point out that they had taken notes on her testimony. I think they want to be correct about what the numbers are. And I want to make sure we have minimal error on economic numbers, but I think the court can say, uh, you heard testimony. So as much as, you know, I want to agree with the plaintiff side, I get that. And, and I, I agree with him. We want accurate numbers. There are so many different things that the jurors are going to re rely on their recollection, what they remember, what they heard and what they wrote down. Um, we want it to be accurate, but sometimes if a juror heard something or made it that made them think this or that, that happens sometimes. And the report's not going to go back. They're not going to correct the juror's memory at this point. Money, uh, rely on your they could ask for a read back of her testimony potentially. Um, and they could request that from the judge. And that would be about the best. Yeah. Now on, uh, I'm trying to get them all on closing. The fact they, I don't know if they wrote them down or not. That's what they're trying to do. And they're trying to keep it so that they keep the numbers where they're supposed to be. And I really, for the record, we have to come up with an approach so that I don't want the defense coming back and saying, they got these numbers wrong, judge. It was 10,780,000 and they came back with 10,250,000. That's not fair. So, well, we have to find the right way. I, I will tell you, I'm not exactly sure what the question is asking. I don't know if they're saying, help us find the, the location of the evidence or if they're asking something else. I, I just don't know reading that question. Fair enough. Okay. You know, the, the second part is the uh, teach us how to do this so we don't bother you type of request. It's kind of how I. Right. Well, right. I think we should answer both parts of the question because perhaps they're thinking if we just get this tech solution, We'll get the access to the exhibits and somewhere in there we'll find Christy Kirby's report. So we need to. He's absolutely right. You need to tell them, even if you show them how to find stuff, that they're not going to find Christy Kirby's report in there because it's not in evidence and they have to rely on their um, recollection. Now, Mr. Anderson is making an argument. And by the way, he's right. The last couple of trials I've had, that's exactly what the defense argued is judge. They came back with this number that was even bigger than this portion. So they must've had the wrong numbers back there when in reality it's pain and suffering and the jury's allowed to do what they feel is right and just. Um, but he's right. If they wrote down $1 billion instead of $1 million and they come back with $1 billion, technically they can, but if they did it because they wrote down the wrong number that they thought Christy Kirby said, there could be an issue there. So Mr. Anderson's like, let's tell them what her numbers were. It doesn't mean they have to do it. I would ask for a read back of her testimony. That's probably what I would do. The judge doesn't have to allow it, but that's what I would ask for. Let's read back her testimony, judge. Struck them that okay. That's kind of futile. Yeah, and maybe the old... And we have a calculator. I don't have a calculator. Seriously, I, I, enough, I do. Gee, I, I would never have guessed. 
But I mean, seriously, look how good they want a freaking calculator. You know, this is not how many times. I said, how many times have I? I've got a jury that's winning, so let's. I said an IT guy, but I wouldn't object to the clerk that put the records together and the IT guy going. That's a decent on job training. I, I'm. I just asked Mike to come down here and. In, in everyone's presence, we're going to talk about the scope. I'm actually going to bring the jury here first, but I wanted to nail down what we all agree on Mike can do. And if it would be better, Al, <coughs> you know, we... Bobby, thank you for gifting some memberships. Can we seriously, I mean, it may be as simple. They don't have their phones, they don't have anything else. Can you at least have my calculator? Because that's allowed. Well, they have not. Had... So, so, so Anderson's asking if they want a calculator. He's trying to get a feel. Do they want a calculator? I told you, plaintiff's lawyers. We like when the jury asks for calculators. Thank you, P-Hop, for uh, also gifting a bunch of memberships. Um, and in this situation, he's wanting to ask the jury if they want one. And the judge is like, well, they haven't asked for a calculator at this point. So let's just wait, see if they ask for a calculator. For a calculator, so I'm not going to create an issue that hasn't been asked. Um, now, there's been some discussion as to whether we should uh, have... IT go in and help them. And so since we're gonna have this discussion, I just wanna make sure both sides are okay with Mike. And, and you also said to have the clerk go in and help show them where the evidence is. No objection. Okay. Um, I also need to bring the jury in and to give them the response. My response should I just say that I'm interpreting this question as you need help trying to figure out where to find stuff. And we're gonna send these two individuals back. They're not allowed to discuss this case with you. They're, they're not allowed to help you or communicate with you other than to show you how to find stuff and how to do it. Is that? Well, that is that is agreeable to the plaintiff. I still request that there be some communication to the jury so we don't have 15 questions about this. If this is the math, let's ask them if they need some help with the math in some form of fashion. What, what, what if I do this? I'll tell them that my understanding of the question is you're asking for help. If the understanding of your of the question is different, send me another note. Yeah. That way I invite the question, but I don't presuppose what they are thinking because I don't because right now I don't more know. information I from more information so, is there. I'm it's four o'clock now and they know that it's gonna take a while. So I agree, Nirvana. If, if they're just trying to figure out where they're gonna find stuff, you don't want we'll it too quick. So um, do you want him to put in a machine that has office on it or just leave the machine? They're struggling with what they have, and he's already turned it into HTML. I think it's keeping it super. Well, can I ask one question here? Sure. Whatever you could put on there, will it have? You got to be ready for anything, Evangeline. Throws a little wrench in the closing argument breakdown, but that's okay. We'll have to take a little extra time today. Ability to do basic math and arithmetic. I believe so. I have to take a look up. I'm fine. It should be a calculator. Yeah, the basic Thanks. audience has a calculator. Well, the machine that's in there right now doesn't have office. All right, so oh, like it doesn't have office. Like swaps. So, there's so, so the plaintiffs are, are okay with putting a machine with office in there. That's fine. And the defense are okay with that. So, do you, you have the computer ready to go? True. Yeah. Okay, so that's the one from downstairs? Correct. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to bring the jury in. I'm going to go read them the question. I'm going to respond that we're going to send. Somebody from the clerk's office and you to go back to teach them how to find stuff. We're going to swap out the computers uh, that they're not allowed to talk to you about the case. Y'all cannot do anything about any of their deliberations. And then um, if they are, if their question was for something else, then they can send us another note. So with that, let's go ahead and bring in the jury. Here comes the jury. Class Act Beauty watch trial every day. So enlightening. Really like the judge. I, he's a good judge. Hope the family gets everything they deserve. We're going to have to wait and see. We're going to have to wait and see. Um, SM, would the defense be able to make an offer to the plaintiff before the jury comes back? If so, would you recommend they accept it? Yes, you can make an offer at any time, hey. even after the verdict. Doesn't matter where you sit. <laughs> I don't think there's going to be... Please be seated, everybody. I don't think there's going to be a settlement here. I think the plaintiffs want to know what the jury is going to come back with. Okay. Uh, request. Uh, we'd like to access the Kirby Christie financial money that possesses the loss earned monies, what Maya would earn, etc. or slash also, we have documents we need to review but don't know how to find it. 
one juror says, quote, teach me how to find stuff, end quote. <laughs> and, and of course, I, I switched off that word uh, with an LOL. So um, have I read the statement, uh, appro or if I have not read the statement uh, appropriately, let me go ahead and raise your hand. So you all agree. Okay. Okay. Um, well, let me say this. I'm sorry. Well, let me say something and then you can talk. Okay. I wasn't exactly sure if you were asking for help in how to find stuff as far as the top part of the question. That's how I'm interpreting it. I could be wrong. So I have uh, Mike from Court IT who can go back and show you how, and I'm going to have a representative from the clerk's office come and show you where the exhibits are, how to access the exhibits. They cannot talk to you and you can't ask them anything about the case. Right. This is just a technical assistance. Right. Now, Mike is going to actually swap out the computers and put a computer that actually has Microsoft Office back there, but it still will not have access. So um, if you wanted something else, um, then send me another note, okay? Otherwise, what we're gonna do is, are, are you ready to you do want that? something else, like a calculator. So Mike, why don't you go get the computer and then Mike will join you in the room in just a moment, and somebody from the clerk's office will be in. But again, Go you cannot ask Thank them you. how anything about the case. No. This is just technical how to find the stuff. Right. The five-letter word as opposed to the four-letter word. <laughs> okay. Okay. With that, uh, I'm going to let you go back and continue. Okay. Mike? Natalie? Okay. Have fun. All right. Here it generates in the next couple of minutes. They're going to come back. Next one will be in about 45 minutes. Okay. Anything else? Because I'm, I'm going to go into recess if there's nothing else. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, we will be uh, in recess and uh, pending the next uh, question or verdict from the jury. Are you closing the courtroom, Judge? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Judge. Trying to listen to what they're still talking. Oh, we're still going back 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock unless you get called earlier. But I, I'd wait five or ten minutes before you leave the building. There might be just another okay. follow-up question. Thank you all. Right we're, we're in now, recess. As the judge said, if you if I didn't read it right, send me another question. All right. So we're gonna leave this up. I'm gonna mute it. Pull it down. It's up on my other screen. I'm sure you guys will let me know. We're gonna get back to the closing arguments here until and uh, if the jurors come back with more questions. Just gotta adapt. Just gotta adapt. Be ready for anything. It's trial, baby. It's trial. Briella, grow the membership here. It's going to be fun Friday with a bunch of new members. John, also, thank you so much, you guys, for gifting these memberships. It's so cool. I love for people to kind of be on the inside and come and experience the whole channel in, in its entirety, which is so cool. Belinda, Peter, is there a cap on how much the jury can award? There's a cap on punitive damages, 500,000 or three times compensatory damages. But in Florida, there's no cap on compensatory damages like pain and suffering or these types of damages they're asking for. They could give 238 million. They could give 500 million. They could give a billion dollars. And then punitives can only be three times what that number is, but we're not talking about punitives yet. So there's no real cap on these kinds of damages besides what the evidence um, will allow. Okay, so you're a, you're a Louisville fan. Louisville. Good. Bring it on. Bring it on. Um, Wendy W., regardless of how or when they decide or how much, this is still going to be tied up in appeals for a long time anyway. How sad? It's it's possible. Or if you get a big enough verdict, then maybe that's when settlement takes place. You know, if they give you $500 million, maybe the, the uh, hospital will pony up $100 million. But right now, they ain't going to pony up $100 million. Um, so it is possible that you settle a case after trial. We settle a lot of cases after trial. Um, so we'll see. K Rab, yeah, we're getting there. Just uh Jules also said after Whitney finished his remarks, the entire jury was crying. So let's get through the rest of Mr. Anderson's uh uh points here. All right, so we got kind of the beginning. He goes into the family background, um, discusses um that once CRPS was diagnosed and the other doctors, nobody ever talked about conversion disorder anymore. Um, he says that, you know, they make all these arguments about withdrawals, but so many times she took ketamine and she had breaks between, and there was no mention of withdrawal symptoms. So is that something the hospital is making up or making fit into their um, narrative, but that none of these other doctors ever mentioned again, she talked about how Be Beata challenged the hospital. They don't like that. They changed their diagnosis change the record, change the narrative. 
They walked in as a happy family with a sick kid and walked out a criminal. And Maya, a liar. And that's not how hospitals are supposed to work. But when Maya's mom starts asking for names, writing things down, they get risk management involved and things start to heat up because hospitals don't like that. And I'm sure a lot of people have had experiences like that where it is true. They don't like to be questioned, but they don't always turn it into a situation like this. So this is unusual. Uh, and then he gets back into, um, let me see here. He gets into more of what Cochran said. And every time he mentions Cochran, my ears are going to perk up because I think that's huge evidence for the plaintiff. In there and looking back at all these records, what was her role here? Sally Smith eventually comes in to see them and she doesn't identify herself as Sally Smith. Whatever she's trying to say up there, you know she came in in a lab coat and she came in with her doctor's pass. You know she walked in and she started to try to get information from them without identifying herself. She was trying to set up a case or some complaint or something. She was the hammer. She was the hammer that they might need. They might need down the road. Should the Kowalskis come back, make any complaints? Remember, this was a place where if the <coughs> if a person complained, there was retribution. Dr. Corcoran? That's from Corcoran. If you complain, there's retribution. I would put that document on the board. I would say right here, retaliation. That's what they did. That was this culture. And guess what? They ought to complain. And they did what they always do at that time period with that management at that hospital. They came after her. They retaliated because she complained. You have the documents, use them. Again, good argument, good connection with Cochran there. If a person complained, then there was a chance they could lose their job. Nobody was complaining up and down, and no one wanted to hear any complaints about them. And here was Biala taking down names. They panicked and they decided. They weren't going to let this brusque lady with an Eastern European accent coming in and telling them how to do their job. They weren't going to let this lady with an Eastern European accent looking at you, juror number one, tell them what to do and tell them they were wrong. I also come from a whole family of nurses and we've talked about this before, but when we're in the hospital, anybody in our family, they've got a lot of questions because they care about their family members. They want to you know, make sure everything's done right. They feel like they care more than any other doctor or nurse that's going to come help and watch them. And it's their expertise and they're going to want to know what's going on. And many times hospitals don't like that. And I've got a lot of friends that are doctors and they say, yeah, something we got to deal with from time to time. Just is what it is. Uh, and then, so here is to me, one of the parts that would make me most nervous, but also kind of make me think they're not really worried about an appeal. And I think they're trying to get as big of a number as they possibly can to potentially settle with this hospital afterwards. And of course, the notoriety that would come with a huge verdict against Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. But this was something that I thought was a little risky and I wouldn't have done myself when he started talking about how everyone's watching them right now. Um, we're going to help here. We're going to help there. And Bia says, no, we're going to go back like we did on the first to Dr. Hanna. And we're going to complete the ketamine infusions because you guys can't help us. No doubt Diana brought her in to see if there could be an intubation and greater amounts of ketamine to try to get her out of this crisis. And when they couldn't do it, she concluded, why are we here? And tried to leave. And she was told, well, if you leave, then you're AMA and we're going to call security. And that's in the records. So they were forced to say, and as much as they try to dig around in the records, ask yourself. We haven't gotten there yet. I started it a little bit early, but we're about to get to the part where I think is an appellate issue and an object. it does draw an objection. Do you believe they really wanted to stay in that hospital when there was no reason to do so? Maya was not getting the care she wanted and the care that the parents wanted. You know, there's a lot of people watching this. There's a lot of people looking at this. There are CRPS patients. There are parents who have children in crisis trying to figure out what to do. There's a lot of people who are paying attention to what you're doing here. And a lot of people watching, a lot of parents, families, people that have CRPS, they're watching, they're paying attention to what you are doing. Now, to me, that sounds like outside influence, pressure to this jury to do what you want them to do, or else you're going to be hurting the people that are watching. We've seen this in some other cases. Amber Heard's team tried to do this. It's inappropriate, not a proper argument, shouldn't have done it. Plenty of good points and things to argue. This was not one of them. It is not relevant to Maya's case. Is it going to have an effect? Absolutely. 
Not an appropriate argument, in my opinion. And it, here's the objection. And in this instance, <clears throat> objection is sustained. Thank you. And it's important. Objection sustained. And he does move on. Hello from Sweden. Triple threat in memory of my son's best friend, Preston. Thank you. L. Borat. Borat. Where do punitive damages go? They go to the family. Purpose of them is to punish the establishment, but they do go to the family. Uh, most of the time they are taxable. Pain and suffering and other damages are usually not. Lost wages are and things like that. But love pink. Just bringing more people into the fold. So cool. Um, okay, then he starts to get into uh, Beata taking her own life and explaining that claim, which I know is one that a lot of you have struggled to see how it connects, um, have struggled to put blame on the hospital for that. So he knows that he's got to dig in and explain it. And this is what he does. And to me, you got to hit it head on. And that's exactly what he does. So let's take a listen here. And you guys tell me, did he convince you if you didn't think you could possibly blame this on somebody else? Um, now is his explanation. Unless something drastic was done, there's a pretty good chance her daughter was going to die in this hospital. <laughs> Why? She'd already seen a friend's daughter die from CRPS. CRPS can kill you. And in this instance, where you've got someone who is becoming so weak that they're laying down and they can't even hold themselves up, you're subject to blood clots that can go to the heart and kill. And that's what Beata was concerned about. There was retaliation against me because they knew I was going after the ICU. Filing charges with me with DCF automatically makes them automatically immune. But what it says here is that Beata knew what was going on with her daughter and knew she had to do something, something drastic. She knew they were retaliating against her. That she knew that she was the key. If she was in the picture, Maya was never going to get out of there. And it was likely that Maya was going to end up in some kind of foster care and in some situation Objection. where she would be even worse. Objection. Um, That's in legal the, basis. The legal basis is uh, the immunity. We're not responsible for it. I've, I've already instructed the jury on that. Okay. She knew if she did not take herself out of the picture, that it was likely, it was a probability that her daughter would die. The best hope would be that her daughter lived but was with some foster parents who did not understand the disease or was placed in a situation where she was going to be in psychiatric care. And the rest of her life, Beata knew because she was a nurse, that Maya would be followed through her entire life, dogged by these allegations that somehow there was a psychosis going on. Afterwards, Dr. Tepa Sanchez. And here we go. As we're going to see in the defense, using the plaintiff's words was really artful and important. Well, these internal text messages are so damning for the hospital. He's going to read them. They have knowledge that people do things like this when their families are facing these problems. And what did they do? They were worse and worse and worse to Beata and to Maya as far as their relationship. They didn't try to make things easier. They didn't, you know, try to get them counseling and help so that this wouldn't happen knowing that it was an option. And they admitted in these text messages and they care about her calling her ketamine girl. It's just, it's not great. Right. And says, she's talking to Dr. Laura Vos at this time. I learned today that ketamine girl's mom committed suicide yesterday. Sorry to say my prediction was correct. That means it had happened before. They knew about it. And yet they still kept the pressure on. They still kept the pressure on Beata. Oh my God. They still thought somehow this was the right thing to push Beata to the edge and over. They knew, they knew she was on the edge and they kept up the pressure. There's no question but that this suicide was caused directly by their actions. On the verdict form, what you're going to see is a few things, but one of them is there's two bases. And you heard Dr. Richards testify about both of them. One is, was it a, a substantial factor? Were their actions a substantial factor in the suicide? I submit, absolutely. The second was, did she operate from an irresistible impulse? The irresistible impulse in this instance was the maternal instinct. There was nothing she could do about it. She knew if she didn't protect her daughter here, she was going to lose her daughter. And Beata knew also, she thought through the effect of her being out of the picture. She knew it'd be tough on Kyle. She knew it'd be tough on, on Maya and Jack. But she figured having Maya alive was better than losing Maya. She knew they could get through somehow. But she could not stand the thought of losing her baby girl. Please take care of Maya. Don't make her suffer anymore. She doesn't deserve that. No child deserves that. Insofar as the verdict 
on suicide, I request that you check. Yes, it was caused by them. And it's important, very important that you answer questions 45, 46, 47, 48, and 55 in the positive. If you want a recovery for Jack and for Kyle, these are the causes of action for wrongful death. And they are allowed to recover based on being beneficiaries of the estate. And I like how he put that in there. I don't know if you caught that. If you want Kyle and Jack to be able to recover, you have to say yes to the wrongful death claim, which includes what happened to Beata. We heard them testify. How can you not feel for them? This is how you bring them in to say yes to this. And they had to go through the verdict form. Very complicated. They didn't really have enough time to go through it methodically. They talked about hourly rates. They talked about percentages, how you have to, you give an amount of money, but you have to put a percentage with each instance of battery and false imprisonment, medical malpractice and things like that. Again, can make your head spin. And they kind of gave an overarching theme because what I think they tried to do, which I don't necessarily disagree with, with only two hours is paint the big, ugly picture of the hospital and what they did to Maya. Try to explain the damages that it caused and let the jury go back there and figure out the numbers as opposed to taking, it would have taken 45 minutes to probably go through this verdict and explain why you want X amount of dollars and X amount of percentage on each spot. When at the end of the day, it's up to the jury. They can give more, they can give less. They can put a percentage on this and not a percentage on that. Percentage has to equal hundred, of course, or he'll tell them to go back and fix their math. We'll see if something like that happens. It wouldn't surprise me because of how complicated this is, but it does feel very difficult even when he explains it. Uh, he made a good argument of Sally Smith being an apparent agent and not just with the DCF stuff. Um, they didn't have medical reasons for most of what they did, like holding her down and taking the pictures at Sally Smith, Beatty, um, all the things they did. He, he hit on the fraudulent billing for CRPS, but denied she had it the whole time. The defense had an argument about how that's not really how it works. And they were providing the treatments that do treat CRPS, like physical therapy and medication and things like that. So that's why they can bill for it. But at the end of the day, He's like, it's a nominal amount. You can put a dollar down. I don't really care um, because that's not where the big dollars are. That's not where they're going to get the big dollars. I think it's just, again, another way to look, to make all children's look bad. And and truthfully, I mean, that's a, it's a pretty damning thing that they say she didn't have it the whole time and they build 500K plus on CRPS. Um, uh, we're just going to hit for a second him talking about intentional infliction of emotional distress. Um, what is it? An extreme caused by the extreme, you can compensate Beata and the rest of her family for her loss. If you check yes, then they can be. If you check no, they cannot be. And then you determine as the best you can her pain and suffering, mental anguish, an extreme caused by the extreme emotional distress prior to her death. And then we'll talk a little bit about this. <laughs> Claim six on the on the estate. Again, they're going to go through whether or not this was an un uncontrollable impulse to die by suicide, we suggest you check yes. And whether it was a substantial factor, it was too, and that you check yes. And of course, the top one- It doesn't have to be the only factor of why she did what she did. It just has to be a substantial factor. But for what they did, would she have done what she did? Six, did Johns Hopkins Hospital through the acts of the employees engage in extreme and outrageous conduct? Yes. And then you get into the damages. And that's the point, extreme and outrageous. That's what they've been trying to explain the whole time. They explained that evidence. He said off the top, you guys sat here with me. He didn't recite all the facts over and over again, which was good. Um, and he basically said, you sat here with me, you know how bad it was. And his rebuttal is pretty fiery as well. But I do want to get to, I mean, they had a brutally sad explanation of what it's going to be like to grow up without your mom, had friends who have lost parents, some at a young age, some even at my age now, and how brutal and sad it is. And he did a good job of really making the jury feel that. Um, he trashes BD, um, award versus reward. I thought was good. This is not a reward. You're not rewarding them for what happened. It's an award to balance the scales of the damages with the harm that was done to them. That's all this is, is balancing it. And I like to say in my closing arguments that I know people don't like the money system, but the alternative to the money system is an eye for an eye. And now Maya's family gets to do that to the people at Johns Hopkins. They don't want to do that. They don't want to abuse them. They don't want to imprison them. They don't want to batter them. They don't want to make their family members hurt themselves. That's a barbaric society. We don't, nobody should want that society. So the only alternative to balance these scales is with money. 
That's how I like to uh, describe it a lot of times because it is hard to understand money's not going to bring their mom back, but it's the only way to justify the award, not reward. And he made that distinction um, somewhat. And then Mr. Whitney came up and I thought he did a really good job. So I'm going to have him, I mean, as good as you can, and you're going to see how complicated this is. And he gives kind of big chunks of numbers because you got to give him a number. You got to give him something to hold on to. We saw with the jury question already that they want to know how they add this stuff up. So we're going to play a couple minutes of him explaining that. And then we're going to play the end of Mr. Whitney's closing and talk about something for a minute. The life care tables back there with you there. And if you apply the rate, a little figure. I jumped ahead a little too much. They're going to be calculated. Here we go. So the last time I had to do this, he gave me a whiteboard and I sat right there and had to scribble it out. And uh, this time he gave me about 12 hours notice. So it's time to do some math. And now he's going to left me 10 minutes to do it with you. So here we go. I'm, I'm, I'm here to give you, it's a difficult task to decide what justice is here for the Kowalski family. So I'm here to give you some formulas using that hundred dollar an hour figure based on the testimony of Maya and Kyle and Jack. And I'm going to put some big numbers in front of you. That's what justice requires here. So we'll start. First, I want to take a look at the verdict form, claim to battery, which is page eight. January 6, 2017, you have conclusive, uncontested evidence in the record that on that date, there was a battery of Maya. And over her objection in tears, Catherine Beatty admitted that unfortunately- By the way, in closing argument, you can say clear, uncontested evidence, but it is contested. It went ahead and did it at the direction of risk management. And question 18 is where you award damages for each of these categories. That's why I'm focusing on each of these, you make separate calculations. Pain and suffering is its own. Mental anguish is its own. Loss of capacity for the enjoyment of life is its own category. And each of them are going to be calculated for the past and future. And I recognize some of you probably have mathematical skills better than the others. So I'd ask you to lean on those folks as you're back there with a calculator trying to figure this out and do what you need to do to deliver justice. So let's go through some examples of how you would calculate for each of these categories. If you pull up slide 57 to begin. What we've, this, this bucket of different categories I've just described here and pointed out to you, we've called them human damages. And so we're going to talk through not all of them because you have to do this for each claim. There are two separate battery claims. There are three separate false imprisonment claims. There's intentional infliction of emotional stress for Maya. There's medical malpractice for each of these. You have to do this calculation. And then as Mr. Harris was saying, once you come up with your total figure, then you decide, you know, this PTSD and what Maya's suffering with, 50% of this was due to, and it really focused on this battery on January 6th. I don't know. That's your job. That's your job to allocate once you have this final number. We go to slide 59, please. I'm going to show you the first calculation here. All right. Mike Kowalski testified. Just him explaining that. He was like, you've got to pick, you know, PTSD 50% if it's on this battery claim or that battery claim. And it's all kind of vague in general because it's a complicated verdict form. It's not a wrongful death claim where a truck hit a person and, you know, there's three questions that they have to answer, past and future pain and suffering, past medical bills, loss of capacity to earn. It's, it's so much more complicated than that because of um, everything going on in this case. But that she experiences and has experienced mental anguish 15 hours a day on average, if you take a good week and a bad week. And Sin again, they look at the past. It's been 6.82 years. Then they do it in the future. She's at a mortality table that says she's going to live this much easy calculations based on a hundred dollars an hour. And then they get total figures, which are humongous. This, this horrific saga ended at Johns Hopkins Children's hospital. It's been 6.82 years. You can check our math on that. That's to the day since uh, she was discharged. And if you apply the rate of hundred dollars an hour, to her past mental anguish, you get to this figure of $3.7 million. That's the past figure. That's the past mental anguish. Mental anguish is one of the categories under battery for the question 18. Now we have to do the same thing for the future. And you'll have the life care tables back there with you there at exhibit, um, excuse me, the mortality tables, exhibit 2060. There's page 002 and there's pages 47 to 50. So you can check that our economist, when, when she came in here and what we're representing to you is Maya's life expectancy from those mortality tables. So we do the same math. We take the hours per day that Maya experiences mental anguish we take the days per year, we take the years remaining in Maya's life, and we multiply that by $100. You get a figure. Three numbers, the, what million the mortality dollars. table says Maya's going to live. Dollars for Maya's mental anguish. And if you go one more, advance one more here, you'll get a total for her past and future mental anguish. 
then you allocate that among the different claims. If you'll back up to slide 55, please. It's so hard to do this methodically. It's so hard not to rush through these. Um, so I just want to show you another example. It's very difficult, but they're getting the point across a lot of money. Uh, we're going to post a poll now as we continue to listen to this. Did Maya ask the, or the amount that Maya asked the jury for was colon, something like that, John put uh, too much, not enough, or just right. I want to get kind of a feel for how you guys feel about the amount of money that was asked for. We have, in addition to the human damages, we have economic damages. And these are directly from the testimony of Christy Kirby, the economist, and the life care plan. This is what I was writing on the whiteboard over here. If you go to and this is these are probably the numbers again. We know that they wanted this information because we watched their question. So let's see what these numbers were. Because if they're considering, you know, this is multi-million dollars right here. Slide 56. This is the essence of what Christy Kirby told you at a wage or an annual earnings of approximately a hundred thousand dollars, which so 5 million loss of earning capacity and 10 million in medical expenses. Now they were specifically talking about earning capacity. So at least 5 million potentially. And if they're going to give her 5 million, it's not going to be the only damages they give her. Uh, we would submit to you underestimates Maya's potential um, be before this all happened to her. Uh, the loss of earning capacity is $5 million. And then you have future medical expenses. And this was based on the testimony of Dr. Bafolko and then Christy Kirby coming in and giving you the present value calculation, $10 million. So now you have economic damages to Maya Kowalski of $15 million. And you'll see this ability to compensate Maya Kowalski for her future medical needs and her future loss of her incapacity in several different places. For example, you'll see the ability to compensate her for future medical expenses in question 17 on the verdict form. Well, that's a lot of money. And then he asks for you know, another 20 something million for Jack and another 30 something million for Kyle. And, you know, at the end of the day, we get to 200 and something, $238 million or something, I think was the total amount that he's asking for. They can give more, they can give less. What do you guys think? They can just also give what the plaintiff asks for. Zebra said, why does the judge compliment lawyers who did not follow his instructions and put on a witness who presented misleading info, no sanctions? It's funny you ask this and it is frustrating sometimes, but Judges expect lawyers to fight hard for their client. Sometimes lies are, lines are gray. Sometimes they're crossed. I guess he didn't feel like any of it was that bad in this case. It was a tough fought battle. And judges do usually compliment lawyers at the end of a trial. So that's probably what happened here. Uh, Joanne, question, Peter, how come the alternate jurors were dismissed? What if one of the six jurors couldn't continue with deliberations? Well, both sides could agree to go with less than six jurors. And sometimes that's something we decide before the trial. Like, would you agree to go with less than six jurors if something happens? And if they said yes, then they would go with five jurors. Um, but it's interesting. You know, it's always a risk. I would probably ask to hold at least one back and, you know, sequester them basically and tell them not to look at anything. But it doesn't sound like they did that in this case. Janet, I'm mad the doctor sent me for a thoracic CT with contrast scan in July. My next appointment was the end of October when I got the result where the doctor who read the scan recommended a new scan four to six weeks later, learned this three months later. It's tough. There's a lot of problems in the medical field. There's a lot of great doctors, but there's a lot of problems. And there's so many hoops to jump through whenever there's a problem. Sometimes it can feel like you literally can't do anything to help yourself. Nirvana, the greatest hope is for the beautiful family's loss may be the beginning of a real change in the medical industry. Um, rest in peace, uh, Beata Kowalski. Kathy. This legal team stands to get 60 million, right? Not saying they don't deserve it, just asking. So the standard Florida contract is 40% is the attorney fee up to the first million. Then it goes down to, I think, 30%, the second million. And then it goes down from there. So you don't get 40% of the whole thing or 30% or even a third of the whole thing. It goes down 20%, things like that. As you go up in the millions, I don't know what the exact calculation is based on what they get. Maybe we can talk about that once we know the verdict. Uh, Sherry. Kathy Beatty dressed up like the doll Miss Beasley for her appearance. Um, quite the change in appearance from her deposition. Uh, bad weather biker. I don't think the plaintiffs are asking for an, asking enough considering the suffering they've gone through at the hands of the hospital. I mean, what amount of money is enough, right? And so far, the poll results are 48% of you think they did not ask for enough. 20% of you think they asked for too much. And a third thought it was just right. So basically 70, 80 something percent think 
that it should be $200 million plus, which is wild. But I don't necessarily disagree. Uh, Angela, thank you for bringing this up regarding Kathy Beatty. Why wasn't she, was this brought up, arrested for aggravated child abuse in 2007? My guess is law enforcement didn't think they had enough. Some of her actions are protected because of her position. Um, and to me, bringing all this stuff to light, it may not have had a light shine on it quite like it has now. Uh, Kayla Pierce, Nick got me all in my feels at the end. Let's get there. Let's listen to the end of his uh, closing, which I thought he made a great analogy. And checking yes on the appropriate questions. You would arrive at a figure of $238 million. Barbara? We're not here to tell you that's the number you need. So here's the total damages they're asking for. So for Maya, her economic, $15 million. Um, for human damages, which is like pain and suffering, loss of uh, parental relationship, $107 million. And then Jack and um, Kyle, basically $115 million. So $238 million. Actually, some of Maya's are probably in here as well for the wrongful death damages. But here's the total amount. And it's important you say this if you're not going to go piece by piece. Barbara, thank you so much. But we're here to tell you that that's at $100 an hour. I um, There's a movie called Onward. He said there's a movie called Onward. I'll slow it down a little bit for this so we can hear it. Um, the, the basic plot is the it's an animated Pixar film. I have kids 10 and 7 myself, so I watch more of these films than I, than I hope to. Um, two, two boys lost their father. And they spend the movie attempting to um, bring back their father for a moment through magic and spells and a treasure hunt. And at the end, they're successful. The hundred dollar an hour figure we submit to you if any of these three had an opportunity to pay hundred dollars for an hour with their mom or their wife, they would do it. They'd pay a thousand dollars an hour. We don't think hundred dollars an hour is appropriate. We ask you to deliver justice for the Kowalskis. Clearly choked up with the onward analogy um, about how the plaintiffs uh, at this point, if they could get another moment with them trying to get it off of these arrest Maya's crying face. Um, so feel horrible for her, right? I mean, you can get choked up. You can hear it. Alec Murdoch was basically crucified for crying during closing arguments. And a lot of people said, what a fake, what a fraud, you know, uh, he can do this stuff. He can turn it on, turn it off to make him look bad when he took the stand. And of course cried again. And I'm not comparing them or saying these lawyers are like Alec Murdoch, but sometimes you have cases and I've had cases that are very difficult to get through when you explain how what happened to your client has affected their life through no fault of their own. They didn't do anything wrong. People screaming, Alec Murdoch lied. I get it. I get it. I'm just saying example of people getting mad when a lawyer cried in closing argument. And I think thinking it was good here when Mr. Whitney cried in closing argument, that's all I'm talking about. Okay. And I want to know kind of where your feeling is. And maybe it's just whether or not you, you know, with your internal feeling and your BS meter, whether you think it's real or not, I think this one was pretty real and I could get choked up myself and I agree with him. There's no amount of money I wouldn't pay to spend another hour with a loved one that we lost. And I think that's a great argument. Uh, Brianna said a uh, movie should be in proper arguments. Absolutely not. Analogies help people think and help people learn. Analogies are one of the best teaching tools on the planet. So in a difficult situation like this, where there's somebody in a jury that's untrained and has never done this before, and you're trying to make analogies, the defense can make analogies too. If they think this is all lies and just a money grab, they can make an analogy to a movie where there was a money grab and say it was exactly like that. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that it was real, it was emotional, and it was difficult to see what his client had gone through. All right, it's crazy. It's been an hour and we've only gone through the plaintiffs. So let's jump to the defense closing. And again, I thought this was a good closing. He thanked everyone, the Kowalskis, everyone who helped them. Um, thanked the jury, thankful for all the great people at J hatch and you so lucky to represent them and things like that. He explains how sympathy cannot come into play here, went through the medical history and how it just doesn't fit CRPS. No one is saying Maya's faking. It is real, but you treat conversion 
different than CRPS or similarly, since it was billed that way. Um, and then he gets into an argument about how world-class hospitals saw this the same way. It wasn't just Johns Hopkins. So let's listen to a little bit of that. Medications, including the oxycodone. I'm going to try to orient you to some of these events by what I call little charts because it's a lot of information to take. And this is just my sort of demonstrative to show you that in what's less than two months from July 4th, we go from wheelchair to hospital, three diagnoses at all children's, Lurie Children's and Tampa General, three world class institutions, multiple specialists seen by pediatric neurologists. They've all coalesced around the same diagnosis. Suspected conversion disorder, that doesn't mean your pain isn't real. It just means what you need is physical therapy, occupational therapy, and cognitive behavioral therapy. And you should return to normal. And, and by the way, not just them, right? Not just them. Defense exhibit, oh, actually, this is joint exhibit. The J is joint. Joint exhibit 1066, number three. Dr. Wassenaar, the trusted pediatrician, what did he say? When he saw my after being released from Tampa General, he wrote in his record, too, there's significant behavioral overlays complicating the assessment noted his concern that despite seeing the note from Dr. Kornberg to stop taking the oxycodone. Multiple doctors from multiple hospitals, multiple pediatricians all felt the same thing. They thought it was conversion disorder, not CRPS. Um, he said, you know, if ketamine was working so great, why were doctors saying she was basically in a vegetative state? And then, uh, you know, one of the best parts, is a couple times he used Beata Kowalski's notes and Jack Kowalski's statements to explain some of the major issues in this case. And we're going to start with Beata Kowalski's notes about just what ketamine did and how dangerous ketamine was for Maya. He's a pollenologist at all trials. This was therapy and plants some seeds to continue therapy, which is mean he's not, and he testified that Maya Genetic component to her pain. Was it reasonable? Fortunately for all of us, here we go. Kowalski took excellent notes in this courtroom, but fortunately for all of us, Kowalski took excellent notes, didn't you? You've seen a lot of her emails. She took excellent notes. Let's hear from her. Here's her Facebook post 10 12, 2015. This is after Dr. Kirkpatrick. Tuesday was a lot harder than I expected it to be. She had hallucinations with monsters, which made her feel very scared and terrified. Mumble, double vision. It was just my ketamine and me taking this curvy, bumpy road to fight RSV. This is really important what's written next. This is really important what's written next. STM, short-term memory. Short-term memory challenges were hard to handle. Couldn't remember my name, where she was, state she lives in. Here's what's also important. Ketamine's no big deal, right? At the end of the infusion, her saturations went down into the 70s, and she couldn't breathe well on her own. This is being given in an office, not in an ICU setting. She got very these notes explain just how dangerous this ketamine treatment could be and how scary it could be. But the plaintiffs would argue it was working and the pain was so bad that they really didn't have a choice. Casey Cat, the one thing this jury won't understand while deliberating is how very rare IJ report is. It can be and often is a death toll for a hospital as a retired RN. The systemic issues from the top down were extraordinary. Now, while I agree with you somewhat, their expert did testify to that, how rare it is, how it is a death sentence, how it's so bad, how they don't just do this to hospitals. But I, I agree. I think Mr. Anderson probably could have hammered it a little bit more in closing, but maybe he didn't want to go overboard on something that could be a potential issue later. Lorna, do you favor exhibits, PowerPoint, and or demonstratives when you close? I'm a visual person. It's more likely to stick in people's memories. I like to use different mediums. So I like to use poster board for some stuff. I like to use PowerPoint. I like to write um, something, you know, on maybe a whiteboard. I like to hold an exhibit up and maybe write and fill out the verdict form on the Elmo. I like to use all different forms and play a video, show a picture. Um, I like to use all different forms for everybody that learns kind of differently. And then obviously I talk a lot in my closings. Uh, Azam, Peter, in your trial, uh, do you have to explain the calculations like these? Yes, not to this level of complexity in the vast majority of trials. But yes, we always have to explain calculations, where we get our numbers, um, and how we want them to add them up on the verdict form. OB nurse, why wouldn't either side bring evidence about what the cost slash life plan would have been prior to J hatch with just the CRPS and depression she had prior? It's a good question. 
Um, the defense could have done that for sure. The plaintiffs probably wouldn't have done that because they would say, you know, they didn't feel it necessary until they got this, but, and it's the plaintiffs, as they argued in their closing, in an exacerbation of a prior injury, if you can't determine what amount or percentage the actions of the hospital made the prior injury worse, then you can apply the entirety of that injury to this cause of action. I've had this multiple times in cases where maybe there was some degeneration and then an accident just boom, knocked the person off their feet, had to have surgery, changed their life forever. Well, if you can't plan out or you can't determine how a little bit of neck pain changed to multiple surgeries, um, you know, changing their life forever, what they could do, range of motion, whatever it may be, activities of daily living, then the entirety of that injury goes on this accident. And so that's why the plaintiffs probably didn't do it. Mercy Cat. I've read Jack had trouble getting law firms to take this case. Why or would you have taken this case? So it's very complicated and unusual and difficult. So I can't say whether I would or not um, without knowing how it was really explained to them. Seeing it now, there's definitely something here. Um, the hospital is horrible to this family. I think they are going to win. I just don't know how much. Megan, the jury, and by the way, they might lose on medical malpractice. And if I was a juror, I might not necessarily give them medical malpractice, but a lot of the other claims I would give them. Megan, the jury didn't hear everything we heard. IJ is serious. SA allegations not heard. Uh, Whitney and Anderson really have hearts of gold. Thanks for covering this, Peter. Getting a tissue now. Well, they did hear it was rare and they did hear it was bad. That did come out in front of the jury. Uh, Nathan C., does Florida law allow plaintiffs to claim attorney's fees? So attorney's fees are not taxed on the same portions that are not taxable, um, but for punitive damages, those attorney's fees can be, I should say, I'm not a tax expert, uh, can be taxable to the client. Uh, Bree, like the two billy goats and a maggot analogy Hunter used the other day. Nathan C, over 6K of you haven't hit the like button. Come on, guys, hit that like button. We've got 9,000 people in here. Let's get it up to 8,000 likes. Hit that like button if you haven't already. Um, Buy Blue Shopper. Great coverage. Healthcare is not always trustworthy. It's not always good. It's not always bad. Um, so I don't want to apply this to everybody or all doctors or all hospitals or anything like that but there were major, major mistakes made and systemic cultural problems in all children's, no doubt, based on the public record now of what's been testified to with this IJ. No doubt about it. All right, let's get back to the defense's closing. I'll answer more questions here in a few minutes. Um, Short-term memory loss is scary. Okay, I was going to play a little bit more of this. Very close to becoming intubated. Th this is what I mean when the defense says unnecessary medications being given at dangerous levels. And so here's the timeline for two more months. She's back at All Children's getting the MRI. We see the record from Dr. Creaseman. We see the diagnosis from Dr. Kirkpatrick on the first visit. And then four infusions, the refill of oxycodone from Dr. Wassener, and she's already in All Children's Hospital for abdominal pain. And Dr. Kirkpatrick had to write her not one, but two refills for a hydromorphone pump. And by the way, this is at before she could even get to Mexico. Was the ketamine working? That they, need, that they need a hydromorphone pump. This is at Defense Exhibit 3402A. You're going to see this exhibit contains not just the hydromorphone, but all the oral ketamine that was being drank in the meantime. They go to see Dr. Cantu. Cash pay. If you look for his records, you're going to find few. I can't direct you to them. Apparently, there's some labs in there, but I can find very little. To his credit, one of you asked an excellent question. An excellent question. Among all the great questions, I thought this was one of the better ones. Dr. Cantu, is this coma controversial? Because it's obviously, they don't do this in the United States. And he said, yes, it is controversial. We do this as a last resort when everything else fails, right? So he said, this is being done to Maya less than, what, six weeks after Kirkpatrick gave her the diagnosis? And again, Beata Kowalski, to everyone's benefit, wrote But to be fair, even before the diagnosis and when she went and had this done, she had already tried physical therapy. They had already tried a lot of things before they got here. I'm not saying I would have done it with my daughter. I'm not saying it was right. I'm not saying it was wrong. What I'm saying is there are different ways to look at how evidence is presented and the defense is presenting the evidence in a way that basically Beata abused her daughter by doing this and making this a first, um, first resort, not last resort. The plaintiff has a good rebuttal on this. Um, he also talks about how the hospital did the right thing, not letting her leave, letting her leave would have been the coward's way out. Um, but here we go. Actually, I'm going to slow it down again after I just sped it up. Um, I'm going to slow it down all the way to normal because I thought potentially this was the best part of the defense's closing. Um, it is 247 in 
And this is when Jack Kowalski is discussing complaints that the hospital, you know, interrogator is telling him Maya's fine until mom walks in the room. And again, I thought this was pretty damning. And anybody that, you know, wanted to side with the hospital or thought that this was Munchausen's by proxy, conversion, whatever you want to say, not faking it, but doing it for her mom or, you know, her mom making her think she has this pain. This is not, this is not great for the plaintiff here. They did. And what was even more alarming about this is you hear these statements about a hospice consult. And at the same time, some of the nurses are saying she's totally fine and resting comfortably when mom's not in the room. You remember this. And if you think I'm making it up, let's listen to Mr. Kowalski. When nobody else was in the room but Maya and the staff, she didn't have to go through When mom would walk in the room, she was insulted. I've heard that many times. In case you couldn't hear him, he said, I've heard that many times. There's no other explanation well, I, I, for that. Yeah, I noticed it too with myself, you know, and then mom comes home from work. And all of a sudden she's back. There will be changes. To your home, your guys are doing well. And all of a sudden, they come back from work, and there's changes. No complaints about pain. No, no complaints but about pain. She's in pain. No complaints about pain. And then when mom gets home, she's complaining about pain. I'm just repeating it in case you can't hear the recording. Let's talk about the pure. Again, I think that was, he put it together. Shapiro was very um, structured and organized and how he went through his closing. And again, I think that's, that's tough. That really is tough. I'm going to kick it back up because I do want to hear a little bit more of this. They're alleging my clients imprisoned them from October 7th to 13th. This is a, this is a relatively straightforward one because my clients took meticulous notes during this time period. Dr. Dolan discussing the weaning plan, recommending transfer to other facilities for, for a hospital that wants to imprison someone. This is often bizarre behavior. This is that joint exhibit 1001633. Look at the bottom. We had a long conversation with the parents. Look, look, look at what they're recommending in the second paragraph. Recommend CBT, psych involvement for treatment, as this is part of the standard care for CRPS. Respecting the diagnosis that this could be CRPS. What she needs is long-term cognitive behavioral therapy and physical therapy. And that's why potentially the med mal would be hard for me to find because they were doing certain things that could be reasonable for CRPS. Um, and you know they're not admitting that they misdiagnosed her and that it could have been either or. And a lot of the therapies they were using could have been used for either or. And they're trying to find the services for it. And not just Dr. Dolan, but Dr. Elliott. Long discussion with the parents twice. Parents in agreement with plan of care. That's October 11th. How about Dr. Smith? She came and testified to you. Discussing the weaning schedule with the mom it was all agreed to. How about Dr. Smith the next day? Again, keeping the parents completely involved in the discussion who agree with the plan of care. Now, if only we had an email to put all this to rest, right? Wouldn't it be nice to hear from... Mrs. Kowalski, what'd you think? That would help settle this one. Yara Kowalski to Jack Kowalski, talking about being accused of trying to take my AMA against mental advice home. That's a lie. That's plaintiff's exhibit 2408-17. And again, I think stringing it together really nicely. I think he did a good job. All right, and this is from a neuropsych that did not work for um, John Hopkins, but again, damning for Maya. They say that you know it wasn't true what he put in his report, and they had some things um, to rebut some of this. But overall, again, I thought it was a good presentation from the defense, whether you agree with them or not. Sixteen. We can walk through this. Maya denies a lot of statements in here. Although, in fairness to Maya, she says she didn't read it. The plaintiffs have tried to contradict this, and they have to. Right? They have to because what's written in here tells a, tells a story. I'll leave it at that. Joint Exhibit 1046-0007. The first thing that I thought was important to recap here is, well, Maya was drugged up, so the statements she made couldn't possibly be true. Remember that? Except in the very first part, they talk about the three-hour session going on, and it was noteworthy that Maya wasn't in pain because she hadn't taken any pain medication that morning. Maya talks about some of the abuse that, you know, we're not here to overdramatize, but it's there. And then she talks about childhood memories and her- They're trying to walk this tightrope. Right, they're not trying to overdramatize the abuse, but they are going to mention it. Of being told about the ketamine coma, and the fifty percent chance of it killing her. And when you're asking the question, "Is Maya suffered trauma in her life?" The answer is yes. Did all children's cause this? The answer is no. Maya suffered trauma in her life, yes, but did all children's cause it? No. Interesting. Um, 
other hospitals filmed Maya too. They're not getting sued. Uh, we can't be sued for anything DCF did. You got to separate that. Maya had uh, the opportunity to get transferred. Her parents didn't want her to. Wild out allegations against Beatty who trying to adopt her, but clearly she was trying to transfer her. It doesn't make any sense. On November 18th, Jack Kowalski was supportive of keeping Maya at J Hatch. Um, they explain how she's definitely doing better after staying in the hospital, which again, we knew they were going to do pictures of her at homecoming, doing great in school, going to go to college, has future plans. Everything's great. She went to homecoming multiple years. She looks great, feels great. You know, that's got to be a big part of their defense because it also minimizes the damages. Um, would a reasonable person think putting a child on your lap is battery, uh, basically just trying to comfort her. They tried to make an awful experience as humane as possible. Pictures of them um, giving her gifts and playing the piano and all this stuff. And um, all their experts, of course, that he mentioned said, what a great job Johns Hopkins did. Um, let's jump now to some concessions. He says the life care planner made. So here is the plaintiff's life care planner. He could not testify what Maya was going to need, but for her all children's hospital in October, 2016. So that's kind of the question somebody asked before, what would the life care plan be with the CRPS that she already had? He could not testify as to why her psychological needs are what they are, but for the treatment made no determination about what she might have needed, but for the events of 2016. But guess what? He testified that she needs this stuff because of what happened at all children's and the plaintiff does not have to separate it because if you can't separate it, you give the full amount. The defense should have put somebody up to separate it. The defense should have put somebody up and said, this is what it would have been exactly like the question said, if she never went to all children's because she still had these issues. Now I did think it was a good argument that $3.7 million of it was uh, for ketamine and she's not using that anymore. So you know, I always kind of get annoyed with life care planners that put stuff in the life care plan that the client's not doing anymore or never has done. I'm like, why are you putting this in there? We're not trying to beef up numbers, just put in there what they actually need. So sometimes that can be frustrating. Um, and then when he started talking about damages, it always makes me chuckle a little bit when the defense starts throwing out, well, we don't think we did anything wrong, but if you do think we did something wrong, don't give them $238 million, give them 15,000 bucks for PT give them therapy for 50 grand or even 250 grand might be reasonable. If you really think that we caused the demise of Beata Kowalski, maybe a million or a million and a half, even per person, three or 4 million is maybe reasonable. And I got to be honest, I've never done a civil defense case and I probably never will um, because I am very uh, uh, against a lot of what they stand for as big companies and especially insurance companies that never represent an insurance company. I don't care how much money they offered. If you're saying you didn't do anything wrong, I would never give the jury any numbers. And I'm telling you this because 5 million bucks for the for Johns Hopkins would be an absolute win. I bet you they'd stroke that check immediately if that was the verdict. But I'm not saying 5 million bucks or a million and a half per person. I'm not saying that. If my stance is and my position is we didn't do anything wrong, we don't owe them any money. It's terrible, but we helped them. They owed us money and they paid it. We're not asking them for anything. Stand behind your position. I, I do not like the fact that they're like 5 million, 250,000. That's okay. That's reasonable. It's like, it's only reasonable if you did something wrong. 5 million bucks is a lot of money. I would never offer somebody 5 million bucks if I didn't do anything wrong. All right, before we get to the rebuttal. Whew, this is a long one. I got to wrap it soon here. Let me hit some questions. Do attorneys usually take two hours for closing? Honestly, I probably would have asked for more in a nine-week trial. On a one-week trial, we usually do uh, 60 to 90 minutes for closing. So it's not unusual to get two hours for closing. K-Rab, Shapiro's closing was so triggering, I had to turn it off. He was basically doing the same thing to Maya and family at the hospital did. In my opinion, it will backfire. K-Rab, thank you for this. Because as I'm going through the good points of his closing, I'm talking about technical legal arguments. But I saw so many people messaging me, so many people telling me that, what a jerk, what a callous, cold jerk. How could he say this? How could he be like that? I'm like, that's a juror. That's who you have to convince. I talk about all the time. I don't care if the defense attorney thinks I'm good. 
I don't care if the defense attorney thinks the way I argue is, is great and bring it down the house. Half the time, I don't care if the judge thinks I'm good. I mean, I want them to, of course, but as long as they think I'm respectful and following the rules, that's what I care about. I want the jury to believe me. I want the jury to trust me. I want the jury to listen to what I have to say. And so in this, the fact that I'm saying Shapiro did a good job, that's my take. I want to hear your take. Let me know in the comments. Amber, can Maya's future medical counseling records be subpoenaed or will they likely, uh, the likely upcoming appeal continue to prevent future treatment? So no, that it's just, the appeal is just what happens in the trial. Future treatment won't come into it. If there's a new trial, that could bring in future treatment. Uh, Ms. Jeevious, medical malpractice stands because they billed for C CRPS, but they treated it then like conversion. That is fraudulent, but that is, that's fraudulent medical billing. That's not technically medical malpractice. Lori, I have chronic pain. I wish they would have gone into it more that the pain waxes and wanes. Some days are good. Other, others, others are just plain hard. I think the plaintiff did do a good job of doing that. And you can only hammer home so many parts in this complicated of a trial, but I do think they mentioned that quite a few times. Uh, retired Nana. No one has mentioned Beata is a nurse. These allegations could put her license in jeopardy. Uh, she, the fact that she was a nurse was mentioned many times throughout the trial. Um, I don't know if anybody mentioned her license because unfortunately she's passed, but I do think they mentioned multiple times she was a nurse. Irish Colleen. Hey, Peter, thank you for your coverage. I'm confused on the appeal stuff. If the jury awards Maya and this case gets overturned on appeal, does Maya and her family lose everything? Sorry for the silly question. So they don't pay it until the appeal is done. So they could award $238 million. Once that appeal happens, sometimes you have to put the money up or, you know, put a bond up or things like that, but they don't pay until the appeal is exhausted as well. So it's not like they get the money and then have to give it back. If they lose on appeal, they got to do the trial over again. Trishy, why does the defense act as though the ketamine treating docs are not in the picture? The mom is not coming up with this treatment on her own and a back alley, go after the doctors, leave their family alone. In my opinion, Trish, because you asked such a great question, I'm going to thank Rebecca for gifting even more memberships now, 10 more, but we're going to jump into the rebuttal because they argue this exact thing. And I thought it was a great argument, just like I think it's a great comment that you made here. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for just continuing to be so generous. Um, all right, let's jump into the rebuttal. liability positions, they still don't get it. What you heard was exactly why we need punitive damages in this case. They still don't get it. Well, I, I think I heard that they agree with some of our liability positions. They still do not understand institutionally, as voiced through their attorneys, how <coughs> awful this was, how terrible it was, the things that they did here. This is Johns Hopkins. This is Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. This is who they really are. This is a place where they call little girls who just, or little girls who just lost their mom, ketamine girl, and, and appear to have absolutely no problem with the fact that they knew this was. They had this ready, obviously. It was a pre prepared slide, and they knew they were going to act like, oh, we're so great. We love the girl, and everybody's so great at Johns Hopkins. They had this ready. It's coming and said nothing and did nothing. This is who Johns Hopkins is. They say, I wouldn't put anything past her mother. Who what past her mother? Trying to take care of her child? She can't perform this charade effectively 24 7. They're talking about a 10 year old. My feels we, ACH, is lying. wonder why that is. What kind of doctor-patient relationship is that? What kind of pediatric relationship is that? Why would you want to keep a child there when the child doesn't want to be there and just wants to be away from you in this first week? Maya feels we, J, or ACH, is lying to her about her mother, that the doctors are lying about her parents. This should never even begin to start up in a pediatrician child relationship. It should never, ever be. This is who Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital is. It's a place that retaliates against its own employees for bringing things out that are negative. Boom. The Cochran documents. Hammer these. They retaliate. Nobody was going to step to Kathy Beatty. Nobody was going to step to Sally Smith. Because they had a culture of retaliation. You were going to lose your job. You were going to be blackballed. You probably weren't going to get another job, whatever it may be. This was their culture. A jury has to see this and think a certain way about Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. I just, I don't understand how they couldn't. And retaliates against anyone, any parent who decides they want to do something different. 
All I heard on the other side was, it's our standard of care. It's our standard of care. It's our standard of care. Who cares if it's your standard of care? A parent has a right, a right to decide. I would say, what do the governing bodies think about your standard of care? They think it puts people in immediate jeopardy. I, their child's own, own treatment. They don't get to choose it. And that's a lot about what this, this case is about. It's about an organization that is so screwed up that it actually thinks it's a good idea to force parents to accept their way of doing things. And if the parents don't, then they've got to find different ways to punish them. That's where all this stuff came out of on the 7th. They disagreed. Beata, registered nurse and infusion nurse, knew what she was talking about and had 15, 16 months of experience as to what worked and didn't work, made the greatest mistake you could ever make to these people. She said no. I think that's powerful. I think that's a really good argument. They still don't freaking get it. They still don't freaking get it. It's like they still don't freaking get it. They still don't freaking get it. One and with the concurrent against the child's will. They knew they, they instituted this from the very top of this organization. What does that tell you about what's going on here? What what kind of ultimate lack? of humanity. There needs to be some captain of the ship and there never was. <laughs> it was totally dysfunctional the way this hospital operated. No one was checking. No one was making sure to see how this child was being taken care of. No one was looking to see how their own employees were behaving. And it wasn't just one. Yes, it has to be clear and convincing, but when you have internal memoranda from the highest up in the hospital down to a Kathy B telling her to do something like that. That's clear and convincing. That's from the highest part of the hospital down to do something despicable. You, you don't do that. I heard a lot about attacking Beata. Here's the part about why go after Beata and not the doctors who prescribed the treatment and she was following those doctor's orders. I never figured out why. If they really... Okay, again, pardon me if I'm confused on this. If these doctors who are all licensed and specialists in CRPS and pain control prescribed what they think was too much medication, why go after mom? Why not go after the doctors? Where have you seen anywhere where anything that Johns Hopkins did questioned the actual doctors writing the prescriptions? No, 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 that's too hard. That's too hard. That might, that might cause problems. Now, it's easier to go after Beata. Plus, she insulted them by not agreeing with what their routine was. Think about this, though. Do they ever know of a doctor who hurt themselves based on a uh, disagreement about CRPS or things like that? Because they knew that parents had and they went after mom, not the doctors. I think that's a really, really compelling argument. If the whole point here is that Diana, who is just trying to take care of her child, by the way, is, is taking her child to places and trying to get treatment and these doctors are prescribing all of these excess medications or this won't work or that won't work, why are you attacking the mother? What would possible good does that do he also shreds sally smith nothing against pediatricians he said but she's not an anesthesiologist or a neurologist but she thinks she knows better than all of them regardless of training experience um he talks about how they try to take credit for all of maya's hard work she wanted to prove them wrong and fought hard to get better it had nothing to do with her hospital stay again i still think that the fact that she's doing better probably is going to affect the damages at least a little bit um we'll see how much or i could be just completely off base about that uh, I was going to have you have him explain the aggravation, um, explanation, aggravation of a previous injury. They objected. The judge is like, no, that's actually correct. That's how you, um, explain it. But I already kind of explained that to you guys. Um, decent argument about how they had no experts testify to damages. They just have a lawyer throwing out random numbers, like 15 grand here, or 250 grand there, a million and a half for this, a million and a half for that. We have actual objective evidence in the record from experts that you can use to come up with your verdict. And then again, a little bit more um, IJ discussion, which again, I would have, that would have been a main component of my closing argument. If the kind of defense they put together, if there was somebody who truly was going to disagree with those numbers, don't you think they'd be in here testifying about it? Instead of having their lawyer come in and attempt to pick here and there at the sidelines of what really happened to this family. <clears throat> And it's not just Kathy Beatty or Sally Smith or some of those nurses. And there were some good nurses there. I'll talk about that in a moment. But 
This was a problem endemic to the entire operation, and that's why they were in imminent jeopardy, IG, of losing their accreditation to be able to- Imminent jeopardy, IG, I think is what he says, immediate jeopardy, IJ. But again, he's making the point here multiple times. He's hit this. Continue to receive federal funding and get approval from the agency that was overarching all hospitals, the industry leader there. This was an organization that was teetering and was trying to get his act together because its culture of people reporting problems was so toxic that they had to have multiple, multiple, multiple meetings and consultants and ideas of just how to fix it. And all that came well after the poor Kowalski family was involved. This went straight to the top. This, this ship never had a captain. And that's how you end up with these situations. It was a totally dysfunctional organization and the Kowalskis paid the price, paid the price. A good point. Good job hitting it there one more time. Uh, also, he pointed out in rebuttal, which I forgot to point out when we were going through the defense's closing, how they tried to minimize the damages by saying, listen, if you want to give her damages, it was 15 minutes that she was being pinned down and stripped down and they took pictures of her. It was only 15 minutes, 15 minutes for maybe 15 minutes after, maybe just 30 minutes. And I was like, that's your argument. And that's why I am not, I, I am not going to coalesce to that argument. If I'm a defense lawyer, I'm not going to say, Listen, if you're going to give some damages, just give nominal amounts, give this or that. It's like holding a 10-year-old, I have a 10-year-old, holding her down while you're stripping her and taking her pictures against her will, knowing she's in pain. Everybody agreed she was not having a good time there or was wincing or whatever. It's like 15 minutes is seven figures to me. There's not an amount that you could pay me to allow my daughter to go through that. Just, it's a horrible job. That's just missing the the awareness of how that's going to come off to a jury of normal people. Um, other J hatch witnesses showed how Beatty was lying. Defense witnesses were too practiced. You can tell when people are lying and telling the truth. And then he ended with, she looks like her mom every day for the rest of her life. She's going to look in her mirror, look into the mirror and remember all of this. That's a long time for somebody to have to deal with this. A long time. All right, so only about 45 minutes until court's going to be back in session to see if they've come up with a verdict or not. If you're going to take off now, I'm going to answer some questions before I leave. Hit that like button for me. Um, let's see if we can get this one to 10,000 likes. If you're watching later, uh, it'll be awesome. We haven't gotten any Maya videos to 10,000 likes, so that'd be so cool. I'm going to burn through some questions here, and then I do have to take off. This took so much longer than I was expecting because we hit those jury questions. Uh, Mike Dorado. Why aren't there more cases like this? I hear so many horror stories. Thanks for covering this trial. There are so many protections and hoops and hurdles put in place for suing doctors and hospitals that it prevents so many cases from going forward because it's so expensive to prosecute them and doctors get so many protections. That's just a fact in Florida. Um, Maisla, is there liability for J-Hatch having made an existing condition worse, meaning post-trauma? Absolutely. Aggravation of a pre-existing condition is absolutely something that can be part of a claim in Florida. And they made that argument here. And Rebecca asked kind of a question along these lines. Why is the fact that she will still have CRPS regardless, not taken into discussion? It is, it was, they discussed, did this make it worse? And if it did make it worse, how much worse? And if you can't tell how much worse, then you apply the entirety of the CRPS to the actions of Johns Hopkins, all children's hospital. Laura V. Jack said anything to get his daughter out. That investigator was sneaky and probing. Yeah, and, I, and I'm not saying that that's not true. But it's also, again, from a legal lawyerly perspective, a skillful way to present a closing argument with quotes from the mouth of the plaintiffs. Lady Losandra, how is the jury separated in this in case like this? I don't know what you mean by separated. They're not separated from each other. They go back into a jury deliberation room with all the evidence and a computer to view the stuff. Um, so that's how they're separated from, you know, the rest of the people in the courthouse. Lynn, you are pointing out legal points, but missing the lies. Like the email about discharging Maya being a lie. She said it was wrong because they would take Maya to another facility, not home. He did that a lot. Well, we can agree to disagree, but I think he was saying the point was John Hopkins was not falsely imprisoning her. They weren't trying to force her to stay there to bill and make money. They weren't sending her home, but they were trying to send her to another facility and they refused. The parents chose to keep her at Johns Hopkins and not somewhere else. I think that's what he was trying to make, but again, we can agree to disagree. OB nurse, since you're in Florida, do you know if complaints to state medical board are public? Some of them are, some of them are not. Some states, those are private, so they could have made a complaint to the medical board and public doesn't know. Um, I don't, I'm sure they did. I don't know if it was public or private. Gregory, 
The jury asking for a calculator at this point in the deliberations, that doesn't look good for the defense, does it? I don't know if you saw a report, but we watched the judge discuss it with the jury. They didn't ask for a calculator yet. The plaintiff's attorney wanted to ask if they wanted a calculator, but they haven't asked for a calculator just yet. Ashley King, random. Judges have their schedule months in advance. How do they take days off? Or what if they're sick? If they work seven, six days a week on a trial like this, do they have other weeks scheduled off? Yes, from time to time they do, but trials are part of their job. So they do have a lot of trials that they have to work through. It can be very difficult. If they have a sick day, they can get coverage from other judges. They can take a day off trial if they are sick. There are different ways around it and we've got to work with everybody's schedule. It can happen to lawyers or clients too. Horse welfare. I'm a victim of medical malpractice. I want people to know that this is how hospitals treat patients. They harm. Many harmed patients end up with $0 after paying liens, lawyers, and medical experts. Micra caps need to end. I agree. Caps need to end. They're totally arbitrary and make no sense to the claims. Hey, Sunny Girl. This happened so much more than is reported, and it's horrific. I know firsthand, unfortunately, we live in California, and the med mail was capped at 250 k That dollar amount doesn't make a difference to a nationwide HMO. So there are different caps for certain medical malpractice cases because um, we talked about caps on damages, and I said there were no caps. There are caps for cer certain facilities and certain doctors and things like that. So there are some caps, but not on false imprisonment and some of these intentional torts and things like that. So, so there are actually some caps, but I was talking generally compensatory damages and punitive damages caps. Um, but again, we can do a deeper dive in that on another day. Curiously, my mom was falsely accused of Munchausen by proxy and I was trapped in the hospital for 17 months. People would be shocked how often this happens. That's wild. Read. I was in court yesterday and today. I don't think the IJ hit as hard as we thought. The jury didn't seem phased at all and only asked one question. It's wild. It's wild, wild, wild. That's huge evidence to me. Um, John, check your text message, please. Ashley King, Peter, you have connections. Get Whitney on stream. I don't know them personally. Um, we'll see if anybody from their team reaches out. Uh, be more than happy to talk to them on stream. EW, welcome. Tons of new members, which is awesome. Um, Angela, welcome as well. Lady Los Andra, I meant like, is there only six jurors or 12 or more alternatives? There's six jurors. They let the alternates go. All six are deliberating. They're not separated from each other. Um, they are deliberating right now together, the six of them. Okay. I think that's it. Uh, John is setting up a redirect back to Recovery Addict. I think people said he's going live back at six o'clock when the court is open. This went way longer than I um, expected. Thank you everyone who joined. That was awesome. Um, I appreciate you guys so much who come on here, ask great questions, talk, hang out. Make sure you hit that like button for me if you could on the way out. If you go over to Recovery Addict, hit the like button right when you get in there. Um, that's all I've got on this one. Uh, John is telling me to stand by though. So I think we're setting up the redirect as we speak, but I have to get out of here. So I am going to play the outro Hopefully you guys join me whenever the verdict comes. We'll probably, we may go live if we can, if we're available. If not, we'll do a reaction like we always do. It's going to be a complicated verdict. It's not going to be a five second verdict. It's going to, um, it's going to take some time to work through. So I appreciate you so much. I appreciate all you guys that came over from Recovery Addict. Appreciate that redirect from him. Uh, hopefully you guys have a great rest of your night. I am out of here. See you on the next one. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who might be interested here on YouTube. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. You can also follow us on all social media, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, at Lawyer You Know. But on Instagram, we are still at Tragos Law. So look us up on there. And don't forget to listen to The Lawyer You Know podcast, available on all major podcast platforms. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us lawyer, you know, at gmail.com. Of course, all of these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, the lawyer, you know.